these homeowners just got this nice stainless steel grill. Now they need something to set it in. They thought about one of those carts. You know, you can move it around your patio or pool area. They're really nice, but we're not gonna do that. Instead, we're gonna do something really special and custom build an outdoor barbecue. Today, we're going to show you how easy it is to install a wall safe. All right, that looks great. This is going to save you a lot of time and effort, all because of this little tool. Do you have a safe place in your home to store jewelry and other valuables? Well, a home burglary happens every 13 seconds in the U.S., so it's important that you do. Today, we're going to show you how easy it is to install a wall safe. There are a lot of different companies that make wall safes, and you can get them at many hardware stores, home centers, and locksmiths. The one that we're going to install today is from Sentry, and it has a steel cabinet with a double-plated steel door. It also has a combination lock and a key, which means not only does the burglar have to know the combination, but they have to have the key in order to break in. This is wide enough and deep enough to fit right inside the average wall, and then you could cover it behind a picture or you can install it in the closet and hide it behind a row of clothes. That's where the homeowner wants this safe, in their closet. The safe is designed to fit between two wall studs, so the first thing you need to do is take a stud finder to locate your studs. Okay, here's one. And now I need to find one on this side. Good, here's the other one. Okay, now I'm going to take the template that came with the wall safe, and this is also the instructions. I'm going to line this up between my two marks and tack this down, but before I tack it down, I want to use the level so that I'll have straight lines. Okay, that looks good there. I'm just going to use regular thumbtacks to tack this down and make sure that you're smoothing out your paper just to keep it straight as you tack this down. And then once you have all four corners tacked down, you can take your tacks out and we will use our holes as our reference. And I'm going to use the ruler and again the level so that I can draw straight lines to connect all of the holes. I'm going to do this all the way around. Next we'll use a keyhole saw to cut this out. But before you cut into any wall, play it safe first and turn off the power at the circuit breaker just in case you have any electrical wires behind the wall. I'm going to take the keyhole saw and put it in this top hole and use my palm to put it in the wall and then I'm just going to saw this down and cut it out. I've installed this screw right in the center of this piece of wallboard so that I can hold on to this and when I'm finished cutting, this piece won't fall down the wall. See, just like that. Now we're almost ready to install our safe, but before we do, I want to measure the distance between these two studs to see if we need to add shims because we want our safe to fit snugly in here. Now this is a shim, it's a small thin piece of wood, and now I can measure the safe to see if we're going to need to use these. There was about a quarter of an inch difference between the measurements, so I'm going to put this in the wall to see what we've got. And actually that's too loose, so we do need to add some shims because we want a nice snug fit with the safe. Alright, I'm going to put one shim here at the top and also one at the bottom, and I cut this off to fit right here and I'm going to nail this right into the stud. All right, now that our shims are in place, we can install our safe, and we should have a good snug fit this time. Yep, it looks like we're going to. Once your safe is in the wall, make sure it's level before you secure it, and ours looks good. So now I'm going to use four mounting screws. I'm going to put two of these on each side. I'm going to screw this right into the stud. All 
All right, look at that. Our wall safe is secured to the wall. Finally, we can add the two shelves that came with the safe. And now we have a great place to keep our valuables. Wall safes come in many different sizes and shapes, and the one that we installed today cost around $130, but you could spend several hundred dollars depending on the features you want. It would take the average do-it-yourselfer a couple of hours to install this, and once you do, you will never have to worry about where to hide your valuables again. Sometimes when you're working on a project and you need both hands, one to hold the pieces together and the other to tighten down the screws, you might find that that's hard to do unless you have a set of screwdrivers that's magnetized. But if you don't have some that are and you don't want to go out and buy a set, you can simply buy one of these. This is a magnetizer demagnetizer. Simply put the screwdriver through the opening and now it's magnetized and will pick up the screws. That way, you can hold the screw, have it ready to go, and hold your project with the other hand. Then when you're finished, if you don't want your screwdriver picking up every screw in sight, then simply demagnetize it by running it across the top. Now it's demagnetized. Something this simple can make your life a lot easier and save you money because you don't have to buy another set of screwdrivers. It's not a piece of exercise equipment, but it could help you beat the heat. I'll tell you about this and some other outdoor products coming up, so stay right there. Today we're going to check out some products that help you enjoy the outdoors. And the first product I'm on right now, now it's not the bicycle, it's the bicycle seat. And this bicycle seat doesn't just make the ride more comfortable, according to the company, it's actually healthier. I'll show you what I mean. This is the Body Geometry Sports Saddle, and as you can see, it doesn't look like your typical bike seat. It's got this big cutout in it because it's been ergonomically designed by a physician to help prevent something called saddle-related numbness. Now that happens if you do a lot of bicycling, the bicycle seat can actually pinch your nerves and blood vessels and cause kind of a numb feeling in your legs. This seat helps to prevent that. Now this big cutout in it right here helps to relieve some pressure off your tailbone, and the seat is actually designed to be a little hard. The designer feels that very soft seats help to promote that saddle-related numbness. Now, the cost of this bike seat is about $40. You can get it in sharper image, and when you do a lot of bicycling, you tend to work up a sweat, right? So you're gonna wanna cool off, so check this out. Now, this is the personal cooling system by Sharper Image, and what this is is your own mini air conditioner which travels around with you. Now, it doesn't really condition the air, but it does cool it down a little bit. There's a switch right here, and when you flip this on, it blows cool air through those vents right there. So when you put this device on your neck like that, you've got some cool air blowing on the back of your neck. It lowers the air temperature by about 20 degrees, so it's great for when you're doing some gardening or outdoor shopping or bicycling. This kind of cools you down. Now, the way this works is that inside these neck pieces right here, there are sponges, and you fill this area with water, the same thing on this side, and it draws in air through the front. It draws it in through over those sponges, cools it down, and then blows it through those vents right there to cool it down and cool you down. It takes one AA battery. It has two speed settings. There's a high and a low, and the cost of this is about $50. Now, if you're looking for something a little more substantial to cool you off, well then, check this out. Now this is a flexible Viper by a company called the Arizona Mist Company. It's, again, another personal cooling system. The way this works is you hook it up to your garden hose, like we have right here, you turn on the hose, and it produces a fine mist which lowers the air temperature. And what's nice about this Viper is that you can turn it in any shape you want. You can wrap it around the pole, around a piece of furniture. It has a memory so it stays where you put it, and it throws off this nice, cool mist Great way to sunbathe and uh, survive the summer. Now the cost of the flexible Viper is about $20. And if you're looking for something that'll cool a larger area, well then, check this out. Now this is called Mr. Cool, and it's also by the Arizona Mist Company. And this is a way of cooling down your entire patio. It's one long tube with a bunch of misters every few feet. It hooks up to your garden hose. You turn on the hose, and it throws off this mist, which lowers the air temperature. Feels great. It's good for the plants, too. 
Now, in the past, I've showed you other misting systems, but those have been high-end custom systems and very costly. This is really a do-it-yourselfer. It comes with these hooks, just like that. You put it up, put the tubing up, turn on the hose, and it works. We put this system up in just a couple of minutes. Now, the cost of this system is about $30 for 10 feet of tubing, and I'll tell you, this is definitely one way to beat the heat. And finally, once you have your patio or pool deck cooled off, you're going to want to enjoy it more. And that's what this is all about. It's called Aqua Golf, and it's a way of turning your pool deck and pool into a mini pitching range. There's the green. It's inside your big water trap right here. It comes with these wiffle golf balls with some Velcro on them. Put them down here. I'm going to embarrass myself now and try and do this. Great way to practice your game. Here we go, a little mini pitch. Oh, nice one. Not bad. I'm pretty proud of that. The cost of Aqua Golf is about $70, and it's a fair way to keep out of the rough. There's a lot of work to do in this landscape. It's been ignored for quite a while. You know, gardening is a lifelong hobby, and it's one that we should be able to enjoy for a long time. Unfortunately, as we get older, things get a little more difficult, a little hard on us. With great good fortune, there are a number of new tools, and I've got a number of ideas that'll help your gardening life last a long time. One of the things that I've noticed about raking is that the grips on these rakes are always too skinny. They make me squeeze too hard. And as we get older, we get a little arthritis in our fingers, and holding these skinny little grips is difficult. Here's an inexpensive solution, an ordinary piece of pipe insulation. You can get it at the hardware store. Costs less than a dollar. Put it on there, tape it in place good so it's a firm grip, and you've got a nice, thick, cushy grip for your rake. And by the way, notice how I'm standing to use this rake? I have to lean over. This gets me in the small of the back. This rake is only five feet tall. It's too short for a guy my height. I should have a much taller rake, one that's maybe six feet tall or more. And then by putting these grips on it, it makes raking a breeze. It's comfortable, it's simple, and I can last a lot longer, and so can you. Now here's a volunteer tree that came up in the landscape. A volunteer is simply a tree that came up from seed. No one planted it here. And what I need to do is cut it off at the ground. Here's another little volunteer tree in the landscape, and this is even worse. There's poison ivy growing all around it. But fortunately, there's a new tool out, a pruning clip with a rotating head. This is really handy, and it allows me to reach inside that poison ivy without bending over and snip off those unwanted trees. But there are times when we have to get down on our hands and knees and work close to the soil, when we're weeding or planting small plants. And here's a tool that makes it easy. It's a claw-like affair. It makes pulling shallow roots and shallowly rooted weeds easy. It's also pretty good for digging a hole. But even better than that, a new trowel with a new handle. Remember how we used to have to hold a trowel? Now, with this, we can pull our full weight on it and dig a hole easily and with no strain on our wrist at all. Makes planting small plants like this one a breeze. And if you happen to have carpal tunnel, this is the tool for you. And speaking of carpal tunnel, here's another device that helps ease the pain of it. It's a rotating handled pruning shear. Not only is it easier to cut with, but it also keeps you from getting calluses as the handle rotates. I think it's got more leverage, too, than most pruning shears, because cutting with it is certainly easy. Today we've looked at some of the new tools that can make gardening easier. But when you're doing a job like weeding a brick sidewalk, some of the old ideas are still the best. Wearing gloves, wearing knee pads when you're on your hands and knees, those are good ideas. Gardening, gardening to me ought to relieve stress, not cause it.
Here's a great tip for you. If you're working with tile or wood and you have to cut around a corner or a weird angle or even a curved cut, instead of having to take all of those measurements, then mark your board and cut it, try using this tool. This is called a contour gauge. You put this up against the angle or corner and simply push in and this is going to give you the exact angle on the other side. Then trace around it on your board And after you have it traced, cut it out with the jigsaw. Okay, let's see if it fits. All right, that looks great. This is going to save you a lot of time and effort, all because of this little tool. Make your backyard the in spot for great cookouts. Glenn Moray shows you how to build a better barbecue and bring out the weekend chef in you. Up next on Your New House. These homeowners just got this nice stainless steel grill. Now they need something to set it in. They thought about one of those carts. You know, you can move it around your patio or pool area. They're really nice, but we're not gonna do that. Instead, we're gonna do something really special and custom build an outdoor barbecue. We're gonna put our outdoor barbecue together brick by brick and joining me today is Master Mason. This is Bobby Gladue. Good to see you, Bobby. Same here, Glenn. Bobby's with Artisan Masonry. He's gonna take us through the major steps on this project. We could have chosen stucco, even stone. Why did we go with the brick? Well, all those are good products for your outdoor grill, but in this case today we use this because it's more durable, it lasts longer than stucco, and it matches our house here today. And it'll, it'll match the house a lot better than stone wood, that's for sure. So aesthetically, it was the product to choose. Correct. Now, step number one is to build a, a sturdy base. We've got one right here. Tell us about how you got this together. What we did here, we cut out about six inches worth of dirt, we moved it, we put a two by four frame to support our our foundation, we poured cement in there, and now we have a nice concrete pad to hold the brick foundation for the barbecue pit. Otherwise, it'd be moving and it wouldn't st be stable. We've got our mortar ready here, and I should have mentioned not just bricks, but concrete blocks for our Fix It Up project today. Now, Bobby, why do we mix in the concrete blocks with the brick? Well, it takes about five block brick per block to use. This isn't going to be seen. This is going to save the homeowner a little bit of money. And it's going to cut down our time a little bit. So we use the concrete block on the inside of our barbecue. On the outside, the facade is the brick. Exactly. So that's why we're using gray mortar on the inside, because it's not going to be seen. Now, we'll set the blocks one row at a time, four rows high. Along the edges, we'll have to make some cuts in order for the blocks to fit properly. And you'll notice we also have to install some wall ties. They're galvanized pieces of metal that will go in between the blocks. They'll help support the bricks so they won't separate from the concrete blocks. Our last block is in place. Our island, our infrastructure is complete. These blocks in the middle, very important. They will support the bulk of the weight of our grill. Now it's on to the brick. We're using some Acme brick here. We've got white mortar to match the brick. And we're going to start and are we going to just build the wall here in front first, Bobby? We're going to build around the grill. No, we're going to first build the first two rows of brick so we know what size cuts we need, just like we did with the block. Okay, so we will go around the grill. As far as the height's concerned, this is about three feet high. How high should it be? Is there a standard height for these barbecues? Well, we determine the height when we buy the barbecue grill first, and then we find that three to three and a half feet is a good height for the homeowner to be able to use the knobs and everything correctly. Our brickwork's almost complete. What we're doing now here on the side of the barbecue is building our compartment for our propane. Now, you can't have the propane right underneath the grill. That would not be fire safe, so we have it here on the side. This is the door for it. It's nice and sleek. Now, Bobby, let's say that uh, we wanted to tap into our gas from the house. Would we have to get a plumber in here to reconfigure everything? Yes, you would, Glenn. You'd have to get a plumber to find out what the city codes were for that area, or that district, and they would trench behind it come up behind the grill and go straight into the back. Okay. Now I do see some ventilation right here. Is that ventilation for the grill itself or for the propane? No, the fumes can build up from the propane, so we have ventilation there because it can be, become combustible. That way we can ventilate the, the fumes out of that opening right there. Okay, so we're gonna finish this out with some brick on top of here. And we're just about ready to install our grill. Day two of our installation, our brickwork is done. We have our grill here, it's by Barbecues Galore. 
It's a three burner stainless steel turbo. Very nice, the Cadillac of grills. We built up the barbecue area so our grill would fit in snugly and we planned on doing that, Bobby. That's right, Glenn. We marked it and dry fit it and we added three rolls of brick around it so we could have a wall around it because it fits in snugly without having any screws or any mortar around it. It just fits in just like that. Now, we're not done with the mason work yet. We actually still have to finish the countertop, but we're not gonna use brick. The homeowner chose stone. Yes, Glenn, the reason we chose the flagstone is because if we use brick, it would have more mortar joints for the homeowner have to clean up. And also it's got a bigger flat surface for them to put their pots and pans on. Notice too, behind the grill, you don't see those limbs from the bushes or the tree anymore. We cut those down because, of course, they're a potential fire hazard. We've got this flagstone here. This is nice. The homeowner made a good choice. And we are almost done. Last bit of grouting there, finishing up our job. Took us two days, but it was well worth it. The grill, it really looks fabulous, Bobby. I want to thank you for all your help and expertise. It's my pleasure, Glenn. Help me anytime. Now, the cost on the barbecue, we're talking materials and labor, around $1,500. The cost on the grill itself, $1,200. There's no doubt there'll be a whole lot of grilling going on around here all year long. Today I'm working on a project inside where the temperature is more inviting. Now I do have a vise outside in my workshop attached to the workbench, but I find that sometimes when I'm inside I need a vise in here as well. There are a couple of choices. This is a portable vise and it does work great, but it attaches to the table and it could mar up the finish. So I'm using this one instead. This has a suction cup on the bottom and it will attach to just about anything. Put it in place and then push this lever down and it's gonna hold it firmly in place. Now here's another great thing about this vise. The clamp pivots so you can put your project however you want it so that it's easiest for you to work on. These are great for working inside. You can move everything in here where the temperature is better and you don't have to worry about marring up the finish on your furniture. <laughs> Now, a lot of times your tools, like this chisel, become dull from constant use, and you want to regain your edge. So how are you going to do that? Well, you could take a file you know, and try to sharpen it up, but it takes forever, which is fine if you're sitting in Alcatraz and all you can think about is, well, how am I going to chip away at the block behind the sink so I can tunnel my way to the bay? Man, I wasn't in there, man. I just saw the move. Come on. A better way to sharpen up this chisel is using this bench grinder by Black & Decker. And this is an awesome tool. It's got a lot of features. Now you can see this tool rest here is angled. Why? Because I'm going to use that to sharpen this chisel. And if you look at the chisel, it does have an angle on it. So when I put it up against it, that's the proper way to sharpen the tool. Now we're almost ready to grind. Put your safety goggles on. When you kick it on, the two lights will come on. One other thing about this is there's two wheels on the grinder. You've got your coarse and you've got your fine. I'm going to use the coarse to start off with and watch me work. Uh-oh, this is something you don't want to happen to you. Now you see what's happened to my chisel, the bluing right here, which means the metal got too hot, and you don't want that to happen to tempered steel, because you're going to lose an edge. A better idea is when you're grinding, is to dip it in this little water trough, cool down the steel, then go back to it like this. Now cool it down, go back to it, and cool it down again. See this way, the steel will not lose its temper. Like me, I never do. Cut! Will somebody please get me some water? Here, Mr. Sir, are you okay, Mr. Sircillo? Yes, thank you. Mm. Not only can the bench grinder 
make your tools sharp, they can make them look sharp too. If you notice, I've changed the wheels out on my grinder. Now I got a cleaning wheel and a buffing wheel. This is pretty cool. And the way I did it was with this accessory kit from Easy Power. Now, you can see that the hammer looks pretty nasty. You know, it's all gunked up and it's not shining no more. I, I, that's not for me. I want my tool to look good. So all I have to do is turn my grinder on and start cleaning it up. Look at that, huh? Shiny, beautiful. That grinder has made my hammer so close to brand new that, oh, and even the price tag came back. I tell you, I really like this tool, and grinders in general come in various shapes and sizes, and the cost, well, this one plus the accessory kit, only $150 or less. And see, with grinders, there's no reason why every tool in your box shouldn't be shiny and new.